Good afternoon. I'm Ann Aylward, Director of the U.S. Department of Transportation's Volpe National Transportation System Center. Welcome to, the, to DOT's Volpe Center and the FAA's New Thought Leadership Series, Up, Up, and Away, Innovations in Advanced Air Mobility. I'd like to thank our leadership at DOT for being with us today, including Undersecretary for Transportation Policy, Carlos Monier, Assistant Secretary for Transportation Research and Technology, and DOT's Chief Science Officer, Dr. Robert Hampshire, FAA Deputy Administrator, Katie Thompson, FAA Assistant Administrator for Policy, International Affairs and Environment, Lawrence Wild Goose, and our guest speaker, Ilan Head, Senior Editor, Editor, Editor at the Air Current. During this seven part series, which will be held between now and mid February, you'll hear from over 20 experts who will share their perspectives on advanced air, air mobility, innovation, and work underway in this important emerging area. Because I'm out of the country with an unstable internet connection, I'm going to turn over the role of moderating the Q&A session at the end of today's event uh, to Ellen Bell, Volpe's Director of Innovation, Strategic Innovation, um, and she will uh, manage questions for our guest speaker. Please type questions in the Q&A box as we go along, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. So I'll now hand off to Dr. Robert Hampshire and looking forward to a terrific program. Thank you all for joining us. Well, thank you, Anne, and thank you everyone for being here today. It's great to be part of the kickoff of uh, this uh, Volpe Center Thought Leadership Series. We know that the previous series uh, have been outstanding, uh, addressing a large range of topics. So I really expect that this advanced air mobility uh, uh, thought Leadership Series will be equally as enlightening and help us move forward as we delve into this very important topics uh, together with our friends at FAA. What I'll do is just take a, a minute or so to kind of frame AAM from a research, technology, and innovation uh, standpoint. We know that advanced air mobility isn't something that's really far off. It's really here and now. You know, the development of AAM is underway in cities, uh, in towns across this country. And we both, you know, FAA and the whole of DOT are moving the AAM sector forward. In just a year or two, you know, we could see operations and adoption of these emerging technologies. But we know that innovation and, and transformation and transportation just doesn't happen spontaneously, that the future just doesn't somehow manifest itself, but really requires true leadership, policy direction, and a lot of hard work from many of the folks on this on this call, but the whole ecosystem. So I think it's true that you know in all sectors, but especially when we think about AAM, it certainly is a prominent role that the government plays at all levels. That's the federal, state, and local levels in, in terms of operating and also regulating this domain. So you know, as a nation, you know, we have this opportunity to be continue our global leadership and set a national strategy for the safe deployment of AAM. And just like we think about our first flight or you know, steps onto the moon, this is a huge step into the next era of, of aviation. So I, also with that said, I put it in a context, we in the department released our research development and technology strategic plan, really as a way to help us frame some of these large strategic uh, challenges and also the changing pace of the transportation sector. So I encourage all of you to really take a look at the research development and technology strategic plan, but really does help us frame out some of the new innovations that are coming uh, quickly at us, including AAM. So with that, it's a lead thought leadership series like this one that really help equip our stakeholders, cities, communities, partners with the right tools. Hopefully you guys have the right people also in place as we continue to make deep investments to help create all the things that we need in our system. So with that, I really look forward to today's discussion and I'll turn it over to Carlos Monge, our Undersecretary for Policy here at DLT. Carlos. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hampshire, and uh, and really thank you so much for uh, to the Volpe Center for all of your leadership and all of your partnership as we do everything in the department. There isn't a, a single accomplishment uh, that that we've had 
since I've been here and, and since the since it's been created, the department that uh, doesn't have Volpe's fingerprints on it. This is a, a wonderful opportunity today to give you an update on everything that the department has been doing to develop a national strategy that is designed to complement the FAA's work on the safety front. And our goal uh, is to illuminate a path for scaled advanced air mobility operations. You're going to hear uh, shortly from Assistant Administrator Wild Goose and Deputy Administrator Thompson uh, about the regulatory and policy work that FAA is doing uh, to enable an AAM future to do it safely, swiftly, efficiently. And our current assignment here uh, within the Office of the Secretary is to lead the congressionally mandated interagency working group on AAM, which is examining all of the wraparound issues beyond safety that impact AAM so that we can mitigate those barriers to deployment and uh, anticipate and address the negative externalities uh, that this resolution can bring. Since the launch of our working group in March, we've had more than 100 engagements with stakeholders uh, to discuss infrastructure development, security requirements, air traffic federation, automation strategies, and community roles, all of which are, are critical for the future of, of AAM operations. We have visited uh, manufacturing plants, uh, witnessed test flights, met with airport authorities. We've looked at vertiport planning. Uh, we've studied the intricacies of uh, securing local electric power. We've met with federal, state, and local experts who try to tackle these, these challenges every day. And to make sure that we're reaching as broadly as possible, we issued a uh, request for information uh, on, in the Federal Register and received more than 450 detailed responses with important perspectives from operators, developers, academia, local officials. Uh, the working group has divided ourselves into a number of, uh, of uh, sub-working groups. And the first is uh, led by the Federal Communications Commission, the NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which is part of the Department of Commerce, and FAA. And that group is working together towards solving uh, one of the most, uh, the, one of the biggest challenges to deployment, and one of the most scarce resources in this new in this century, which is radio spectrum. Uh, and the working group is studying the potential future spectrum needs uh, for low altitude AAM, as well as some of the steps that we can take uh, to take advantage of the spectrum that's available. Uh, the Pentagon, FAA, and NASA are leading a, a second team that's looking for ways to streamline the research and testing that are needed uh, for the advances in automation. And that includes uh, bringing tools to bear to understand artificial intelligence and machine learning support for traffic management and aircraft operations, as well as possible digital infrastructure investments that are needed in order to advance uh, the NAS uh, architecture here. Uh, Third group is the Transportation Security Administration, which is co-leading a group with the FAA, again, to work out the physical and cybersecurity requirements for operations in the future so that our nation's skies remain the gold standard for transportation safety. And we are also proud to work, uh, to do work that's informed by the full interagency working group to support effective community engagement as the aircraft and the vertiports come online. By clarifying those public agency roles anticipating the workforce needs and impacts, and promoting accessibility uh, for people with disabilities, for low-income folks during the design uh, process and sharing those best practices out with state, regional, and local uh, planning initiatives. This group is actively thinking about all the trade-offs, all the impacts today, so that the communities can avoid the disruptions tomorrow uh, when a the AM ecosystem is mature. Across all these teams, uh, the federal officials really do feel pride in helping to usher in a new era of transportation. People are literally jumping on their seats in our, in our, in our uh, Lunch and Learn series. Our subject matter expert, uh, experts are invested in the art of what is possible. Uh, AAM has the potential to transform not only aviation, but the, the broader network. First, uh, in the realm of safety, AAM promises advances in safety enhancing technologies that can make not only air taxis, but all aircraft safer to fly, uh, and our air traffic management man uh, system more precise. Smart aircrafts that, uh, that monitor total systems health and broadcast that information out to pilots, to controllers, to flight operation centers is a goal that, we, uh, that would also benefit the entire transportation system. Efficiency. You know, the AAM 
concept at scale aims to have aircraft fly at separation distances never before achieved in the history of aviation. We're talking about going from five mile safety volumes to technologies that can maintain a separation of less than a mile of airspace. While it will be proven over time, imagine what that might unlock for the efficient use of our airspace across the nation. For the environment, zero emitting electric aircraft are just the tip of the iceberg for the possible environmental benefits that are ushered in by AAM. The entire transportation industry could benefit from aviation with reduced emissions at the system level and potentially learn from this emerging industry to support and enhance legacy ones. Finally, intermodality, which is just a fancy way of saying seamless transportation. Uh, the work that we'll do around vertiports uh, to reduce the waiting time associated with switching between different forms of, of travel uh, will mean that regardless of how you're getting around, uh, the learnings will be able to make it easier to leave the car behind, get to where you're going by seamlessly taking a bus to the air taxi and then a train to work. In short, we believe that the benefits that AAM can unlock are not only limited to aviation, but can enhance the entire system. Earlier this month, with FAA support, we saw a vehicle test taking to the New York skies, lifting up from one of the densest locations on Earth. So we know, uh, as Dr. Hampshire mentioned, and you hear it from others, that this revolution is coming, uh, and it's coming very soon. The approach is also well supported by the innovation principles that Secretary Buttigieg laid out last year. And those principles emphasize safety while allowing for experimentation, learning from failure, staying flexible in adapting the new technology and providing opportunities to collaborate. Many of the communities we've talked to are looking to AM as a possible means to address inequities in our transportation access, bringing jobs to underserved communities, delivering medical services to areas that uh, ambulances just can't reach in time. If AAM can pioneer the technologies that connect and coordinate surface and air traffic, all while increasing safety, efficiency, equity, and environmental sustainability across the United States, then it deserves the, all the attention we are giving to it, and we are. And I'm so excited uh, to share with, what, with you what we've been working on. Uh, stay tuned. You know, Congress gave us a deadline of next August, and we're going to make we're going to hit that mark. Uh, and uh, we're making a great deal of progress. I I, I really appreciate uh, our guest speaker today, and look forward to the rest of the presentation. Well, I, I too want to express my sincere thanks to Anne and the entire Volpe team for their outstanding partnership on our Up, Up, and Away Innovation and Advanced Air Mobility Leadership Series. Greetings to all of our wonderful attendees. Your presence here today highlights the importance of thoughtful discussions that fuel creativity and ingenuity. As the FAA's Assistant Administrator for Policy, International Affairs, and Environment, I have an uncompromising commitment and passion for ensuring the safe and efficient integration of advanced air mobility operations into the national and international airspace systems. I am excited about the opportunities that AM offers, so I know this series will be both engaging and informative. As you've likely seen, the discussions will cover several themes that are extremely important to advancing AAM operations, which include safety, transformation, economic strength and global competitiveness, environmentally responsible integration, equity, international collaboration, and workforce. These key themes will provide an excellent framework for our talks. In discussing the integration of AAM into our national airspace system, we understand that there are tremendous opportunities ahead. However, we must proceed with a steadfast commitment to safety. And while we continue to transform our sector, investments in purpose-driven research and innovation are necessary to ensure that AM serves the public in the coming decades. In addition, it is encouraging to see the opportunities that AM is already presenting, and we know there is so much more to come in this area. It is essential to continue considering the potential environmental impacts that these new technologies may have and mitigate them. AM also provides another opportunity to look at inequities across our transportation systems and communities. So we will engage underserved and underrepresented populations and ensure that we address adverse community impacts and health impacts. Furthermore, I want to reinforce that our engagements are not limited to the national airspace system. 
collaboration with our international partners is critical to safely and successfully integrating these new technologies. The final theme, workforce, is another real and significant benefit that AM will bring to communities across the country. The AM industry will create career opportunities from pilots and dispatchers to technicians and engineers and so much more. There are many exciting innovations on the horizon. So in closing, I want to thank everyone for their commitment and dedication to the aviation and aerospace sector and for getting our leadership series off to a great start. I look forward to the upcoming discussions. Now, it is my sincere pleasure to turn the floor over to our very distinguished FAA Deputy Administrator, Katie Thompson. Thank you, Lawrence, and, and thank you, Dr. Hampshire and Undersecretary Monhe for, for, for setting the stage. Um, as, as you've heard from all of the, the prior speakers, we really are looking to engage across, across government with our external stakeholders, uh, domestic governmental officials, and internationally to help us identify look around corners and, and, and build for the future. So it's great to be with all of you today. Volpe is playing a critical role in helping us better connect with stakeholders who have vested interests and are curious about knowing more and the role that they can play in helping us move, move forward. Um, I'm gonna drill down a little bit deeper on what FAA is specifically doing in partnership with DOT and, and so many others. Um, as, you, as you've heard several times already, FAA takes tremendous pride in our history of helping make air travel possible for everyone everywhere. Today, we have a laser-like focus on maintaining aviation's record of being the safest form of transportation, even as our skies become more congested and more complex. Safety will always be our North Star. But we don't just say safety and we're done. We continue to look to build for the future um, of this country, the future of aviation and what global air travel could and should look like. Our foundational goal for AAM is introduction into our cities, suburbs, and underserved and rural communities uh, and ensure that it occurs safely. Public confidence in AAM's fundamental safety, safety is essential to its ultimate success in both the short term and the long term. Our objective under our new administrator, Mike Whitaker's leadership, will be to maintain our focus on safety while spurring and supportive innovation. And we embrace this great challenge of our time. Today, the FAA is hard at work to advance AAM integration in ways that are safe, efficient, equitable, and sustainable. Our unique role is to ensure all aviation safety aspects of AAM integration are met, including operating rules, aircraft certification, and pilot certification. We are also involved in efforts to find places for these vehicles to take off and land safely in ways that are compatible with um, community uses and, and, and neighborhood expectations. Our approach involves, um, at, at the essence, a cross-agency collaboration um, in addition to the work that we do with DOT, our federal partners, and other external stakeholders. We are involved in every aspect of supporting AAM flights. This includes the aircraft itself, the framework for operations, access to the airspace, operator training, infrastructure development, environmental impacts and mitigating those impacts, and of course, community engagement. In other words, it's not just about air taxis, it's about everything that is necessary to support those flights. To support this effort, we are also investing in the future of AAM workforce, as Lauren mentioned. We've engaged in numerous outreach programs to K through 12 students across the country, as well as internships and work study programs for college students. We understand that AAM will not only be a game changer for how people move around, but also for how the economy will grow and evolve and our ability to develop rewarding careers for our younger generation. 
A year ago, we met our first milestone for rules governing these operations. They will allow um, manufacturers to achieve safety standards in innovative ways by determining the certification requirements for an electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle, the design of that vehicle, production, airworthiness, and operations. We were really pleased that commenters were generally supportive of our approach and look forward to moving forward with that rulemaking. This year, the pace of progress has intensified and you'll continue to see it move faster as we move forward. In May, we released an updated blueprint for airspace and procedure changes to accommodate future air taxis and other AAM operations. It provides for AAM operations to begin relatively at a slow rate with air ta taxis flying on long designated corridors, much as helicopters do today. They will use existing routes and infrastructure so, such as helipads and existing vertiports. We will begin testing the blueprint this summer with our industry partners. We're very much invested in AAM's human factor element as well. In June, we propose a comprehensive rule for training and certifying pilots. It will provide certainty to pilots and industry on our requirements and be clear about our expectations for operating AAM aircraft. In July, we reached, released our Joint Government Industry Innovate 2028 Implementation Plan. Innovate 2028 shows how our joint um, work will come together, increasing, uh, supporting increasing scale and automation of AAM operations and integration with other aircraft types in our national airspace system. And just last month, we signed an agreement with the US Air Force on data exchange and capability sharing for AAM testing. This is one of several partnerships, and Carlos mentioned this, that we have with the Department of Defense, NASA, the US Department um, Volpe Center, and various universities to ensure a robust AAM research base. This is a lot of progress in a short amount of time, but we look forward to doing more. With future operations in mind, we're engaging with local, state, tribal, and territorial governments. Our focus is local and regional planning, ensuring sufficient power infrastructure, intermodal transportation connect connection, and of course, equity. These stakeholders will be vital partners in helping achieve AAM's promise. Turning to the international community, we are actively engaged with ICAO and the European Aviation Safety Agency, as well as other civilian aviation authorities. Our goal is to exchange expertise and promote the harmonization of AAM integration strategies. We are now part of the National Aviation Authorities Network, a partnership with the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. This network will address possible alignment of certification processes and standards for AAM aircraft. We have also signed declarations of cooperation with Japan and South Korea on integrating and certifying AAM aircraft. The bottom line is we are giving the full spectrum of AAM development the attention it needs and we will continue to do so. We are on pace to see the first certification of an AAM aircraft within the next two years. With tremendous support from FAA, industry is busily writing the next chapter in the history of aviation. It's our opportunity to lay a solid foundation for this exciting new era and help it evolve. I'll close with this thought. Back in 1984, when Los Angeles hosted the uh, opening ceremonies of the Summer Olympics, the, cer the ceremony began with a man flying with a jet pack on his back from the roof of the Coliseum to the track below. Yes, this was a great example of American genius and inventiveness, um, yet jet, jet packs were and are an expensive novelty item, not a common means of transport. In less than five years, another Olympics will take place in the City of Angels. It is our fervent hope and hope yours as well that in these games, rather than being a cool and funky concept to talk about, electric air taxis will be in widespread use. I can envision them being used to transport thousands of athletes, officials, and spectators safely from venue to venue. 
that is the future that we are proud to create. Up, up, and away, indeed. On that note, let me turn it back to Ann Elwood. Thank you, Katie. Um, and thanks to the entire leadership team uh, for providing valuable updates and information on AM. I'm now pleased to introduce our primary speaker for today, Ilan Head, who is the senior editor at the Air Current, where she leads the publication's coverage of advanced air mobility and emerging technologies. She has received numerous accolades for her work as a professional journalist, including the National Press, Press Club's Michael a. Dornheim Award and multiple aerospace media awards. She's also an FAA Gold Seal flight instructor with helicopter and instrument helicopter ratings, who has held commercial helicopter licenses in Canada and Australia, as well as in the United States. She will now provide some historical context for advanced air mobility and talk a bit about what's needed to achieve, excuse me, an economically viable industry and meet our shared goal of a safe, competitive, and efficient transportation system. The floor is yours and thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So I am actually joining this webinar from Belize and Belize is an amazing place to be, uh, but unfortunately the Wi-Fi connection down here can be fairly unstable. So I have taken the precaution of recording my presentation in advance. So you will be watching a video of me for the next 18 or so minutes. Uh, but I am here and I look forward to joining the question and answer session later. I can already tell from the, the comments so far that it's going to be an interesting and engaging one. So thanks for having me and I think we can go ahead and roll the video. Hello. My name is Alon Head, and I'm senior editor at The Air Current. I've been writing about aviation for almost 20 years, ever since I went for my first helicopter ride and decided to become a helicopter pilot. A little over six years ago, I began covering advanced air mobility when I attended the first Uber Elevate Summit. Since then, I've come to specialize in eVTOLs, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, and I cover all aspects of the industry, from technology to policy to the financial side of the business. When I was asked to give the opening keynote for this thought leadership series, I wanted to do more than simply rehash what I've already written about advanced air mobility. And so I took the opportunity to explore an idea that's been in the back of my mind for a while now. I'm going to share a little known piece of my family history, something that I myself didn't pay much attention to until recently. Specifically, I'm going to take you back in time to the 1920s and 30s to talk about rigid airships, also known as Zeppelins, named after Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin, the man who invented them. In the process, I hope to set the stage for the Volpe Center's webinar series, which will be focused on how to make advanced air mobility safe, successful, and equitable. So why am I talking about airships? It's because of this man, Harry Vissering, who is standing on the right in the inset photo next to Rear Admiral William Moffat. The photo was taken in 1928 as they were awaiting the arrival of a German airship, the Graf Zeppelin in Lakehurst, New Jersey, on its first intercontinental flight. Vissering was a successful businessman and my great-great-grandfather. In 1919, he was visiting Germany when he took a flight on a Zeppelin company airship named the Bodensee. Much like my first helicopter ride changed the course of my life, Vissering's first airship ride changed the course of his. He became convinced that airships were the wave of the future. Eventually, he persuaded Goodyear Tire and Rubber to establish a joint venture with Zeppelin, and he gave up his other business interests to become a director of the Goodyear Zeppelin Corporation. Obviously, Zeppelins never took off in the way that my great-great-grandfather hoped, which is why today I'm speaking to you as a working-class journalist rather than as a wealthy heiress. My sole inheritance from this era is a library of books about airships, including one that Vissering wrote himself in 1922. Last year, I was paging through that book, which is called Zeppelin, The Story of a Great Achievement, when I realized that it sounded very familiar. 
It sounded, in fact, like the 1920s version of an advanced air mobility pitch deck. Let me give you some examples. EVTOL companies today like to talk about how their aircraft will save people time by allowing them to soar over traffic. Well, saving time was pretty important to Vissering, too. Back when it was still impractical for passengers to fly long distances in airplanes, Zeppelins showed incredible potential for moving people across oceans and continents. They could literally shave days off a trip across the Atlantic. That's pretty impressive when eVTOL companies today are measuring their potential time savings in minutes. eVTOL companies have also invested a lot of effort into establishing the feasibility of urban air mobility routes. Today, eVTOL companies use data about ground trips, income levels, traffic congestion, and weather to predict which future air routes will be the most profitable. Here's an example from Joby Aviation. The modeling may be more sophisticated now, but airship proponents once also put a lot of careful effort into modeling commercial routes. Here, Vissering describes the outlook for a New York to Chicago route that was based on an analysis of historical weather data. The results may be a little too optimistic, but the same could probably be said for some prospective eVTOL routes. Then there's the topic of public acceptance, something that advanced air mobility companies spend a lot of time talking about, even if they're still in the early stages of actually engaging with communities. Take a look at these quotes from Vissering. It sounds a lot like the talking points of eVTOL companies today. He acknowledges that public support will be essential, but expresses confidence that any reluctance can be overcome through safe and reliable operations. He would be right at home on any eVTOL panel fielding questions about community acceptance. Even though the technology was very different, airships foreshadowed advanced air mobility in some important ways. They promised a mode of air transportation that would dramatically change people's lives for the better, primarily by saving them time. Much like eVTOLs today, this promise galvanized many talented inventors and entrepreneurs, people like my great-great-grandfather. It attracted investment from successful companies like Goodyear. It also had many champions in the U.S. government and military, as well as the governments and militaries of other countries. So, what happened? Why did this compelling vision of a future full of airships not come to pass? And can the advanced air mobility industry learn from the history of airships to avoid the same outcome? I believe that it can. Before I started researching this presentation, I actually didn't know much about the history of airships. I figured that the Hindenburg disaster was sufficient to explain why I lack generational wealth. That and the fact that airplanes got really good. If you can cross the Atlantic in eight or nine hours in an airplane, rather than two and a half days in a Zeppelin, even if you're cramped and miserable while doing it, the airplane will win out. Like Vissering said, saving in time is the great essential. This type of technology-centered explanation is pretty common. Most of us assume that superior technologies will always prevail and inferior technologies will die out. But it doesn't totally explain the failure of airships. Airships encountered many technical problems, yes, but they can still do things that airplanes can't, like loiter for long periods of time and carry heavy loads while using much less energy. That's why some startups, such as LTA Research, are trying to revive airships now when climate change has made the efficient use of energy much more important. The more I dug into the small academic literature on airships as a failed innovation, the more I realized that social, economic, and political factors all played important roles in their demise. This is where I think the advanced air mobility industry can benefit from lessons learned. I'm going to talk about three of those lessons, the importance of customer buy-in, the role of networks, and the need for operational safety. This is not intended as a comprehensive lecture on the history of airships, so if you're an airship historian, please don't be too hard on me. I won't be giving a complete explanation for why airships failed, just highlighting a few points that I think are especially relevant to our situation today. First, customer buy-in. 
I spoke about one man in this photo, but I didn't say much about the other. Rear Admiral William Moffat led the U.S. Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics starting in the 1920s, and he's known as the architect of naval aviation. He was also a fan of airships. Up until his death, which we'll talk about later, he championed a role for airships in the Navy and made sure that the Navy's airship program received funding, even as heavier-than-air machines were rapidly advancing in capabilities and importance. Proponents saw a military role for the airship as a strategic scout. It could cover much greater distances than could the airplanes of the time. A Zeppelin could even hangar small airplanes like an airborne aircraft carrier to further extend its scouting range. Here's some historical footage from the National Archives showing how that worked on the USS Akron, one of the U.S. Navy's large rigid airships, which was built in Ohio by Goodyear Zeppelin. An airship could also hide itself in a cloud layer and extend an observer in a small basket to spy on what was happening beneath. The U.S. Navy didn't get too far with this concept, but spy basket duty was reportedly popular in the German military because it was the only place where airship personnel were permitted to smoke. So airships had support at the highest levels of the Navy, but they didn't have many fans in the operating Navy. Moffat had a reputation as a politician and a showman. Here he is schmoozing with Henry Ford. He tasked his airships with many public relations flights, which meant less time available to address technical problems and integrate effectively with the fleet. When airships did take part in naval exercises, commanders assigned them to tactical tasks for which they were not especially well suited. The commanders were not impressed. After Moffat's death, the operating Navy rejected efforts to continue investing in naval airships. Let's apply this to advanced air mobility. Thus far, eVTOL companies have been very successful in gaining support for their vision from high-level government leaders. That's why we're all here today. But they still need to win over the people who will actually use their aircraft. In the case of the naval airships, the customer was the operating Navy. In the case of urban air mobility, which is the target market for most eVTOL companies, the customer is the general public. We're already starting to see some community resistance to urban air mobility. In Los Angeles, the Quiet Skies Coalition has told the federal government to stop its rush to accommodate what it calls a frivolous new industry. More recently in Paris, some elected officials have blasted eVTOLs as useless gadgets for the hyperprivileged. Those attitudes don't bode well for the industry, and just like Admiral Moffat, eVTOL companies aren't necessarily helping their cause with flashy publicity events that don't involve their eventual customers. The support of high-level leaders can be essential at the early stages of an industry, but leaders come and go. To have staying power, you really need the support of a broad and committed customer base that buys into your use case. Community support is going to be especially important to eVTOL companies for another reason, network effects. We've talked about why airships didn't succeed in the U.S. Navy, but my great-great-grandfather also envisioned them in regular commercial service. So why didn't that pan out? A historian named Helmut Braun proposed an interesting theory to explain this. Braun pointed out that compared to airplanes, airships needed a lot more infrastructure in order to operate. They needed tall mooring masts and lifting gas stations in addition to fuel stations. They needed enormous hangars at their regular bases to shield them from the weather. Building that infrastructure was much more costly than building airstrips and smaller hangars for airplanes. It was consequently easier to build infrastructure for airplanes, and the network of airports serving airplanes grew much faster. That meant commercial airplanes were able to reach a critical mass of passengers and destinations to spread the costs of the infrastructure across a larger fleet and many more tickets. Commercial airship companies were never able to create the critical mass they needed to become economically viable. Fortunately for eVTOL developers, eVTOLs need much less infrastructure than do airships. But the economic success of urban air mobility will still hinge on reaching a critical mass of passengers and vertiports. If communities don't allow that network of vertiports to be built, urban air mobility will never scale. 
An interesting side note here is that Braun also looked at why airships failed to succeed in transatlantic commercial service, where they had a much greater advantage over early airplanes compared to intracontinental routes. Here, the airship industry ran into some bad timing and competing interests. First, the Great Depression wiped out much of the demand for a potentially lucrative service across the North Atlantic. When the Zeppelin companies operating the division finally did launch a transatlantic service, it was in the South Atlantic to Brazil because some powerful German ship owners didn't want Zeppelins competing with their ocean liners between Europe and North America. It wasn't until the summer of 1936 that a North Atlantic airship service launched using the Hindenburg. And as we all know, that tragically went up in flames in Lakehurst, New Jersey in May 1937. Which brings me to my third lesson learned about safety. I sometimes hear people say that one fatal accident could destroy the advanced air mobility industry. I don't think that's actually the case. I think the public will be able to move on from one fatal crash, but they probably won't be willing to tolerate many fatal crashes. Today, we all know about the Hindenburg because of the dramatic newsreel images of it burning, but it was not the first fatal airship crash not by a long shot. The U.S. Navy suffered a number of airship accidents, including the crash of the USS Akron in 1933. That remains the world's deadliest airship crash, killing 73 of the 76 people on board. Among them was the architect of naval aviation and one of the airship's greatest champions, Rear Admiral William Moffat. When most people think of the Hindenburg, they think of hydrogen. The Germans used hydrogen as the lifting gas for their Zeppelins, in part because they couldn't get their hands on helium, the supply of which was tightly controlled by the United States. The flammability of hydrogen accelerated the destruction of the Hindenburg and other airships, including the R-101, a British airship that suffered a deadly crash in France during its maiden overseas voyage in 1930. There is still some controversy over what exactly caused the Hindenburg to catch on fire, but once it did, the huge gas bags full of hydrogen didn't help. The USS Akron used helium, not hydrogen, so it was theoretically a safer aircraft. The reasons why its crash were so deadly were operational, not technical. First, it flew into an unexpectedly violent storm, which caused it to crash in the cold Atlantic. Because the crew had not been issued life vests, most of them died of hypothermia and drowning. This is a photo from the Naval Archives that I thought was especially poignant, of some Curtis Bife planes returning to their base at Floyd Bennett Field, New York, after searching for survivors from the Akron. I think this accident illustrates why we can't expect to guarantee the safety of advanced air mobility solely through aircraft design. We need to take a holistic approach to safety that emphasizes safe operations, which will sometimes mean conservative operations, which will sometimes mean less profitable operations. The Zeppelin company learned this lesson under the leadership of Hugo Eppner, whom I feel some affinity to because he was a journalist who caught the aviation bug and became an airship captain. Thanks to his relentless focus on safety and training, the Zeppelin company flew commercial passengers and hydrogen-filled airships for more than two decades off and on without serious injury. That record lasted until the Hindenburg disaster, which the company might have recovered from, except the Second World War came along. Eckner, by the way, was an anti-Nazi who was sidelined by the Third Reich. As I mentioned, I've been writing about eVTOL aircraft for a number of years now, and I'm always a little surprised at how different people can have very different takes on my stories. Some people think I'm too easy on the industry, some people think I'm too harsh. Comparing advanced air mobility to a technology that is most famous for having gone up in flames is probably going to push more people to the harsh side. Because of that, I want to close out by emphasizing that I really do believe in the enormous potential of electric aviation to change our lives for the better. Personally, I think that my great-great-grandfather, who was also a big advocate for trains, was a climate change hero. The world would probably be better off right now if airships had continued developing into a safe and low-carbon form of transportation. 
I know that I would probably be better off. It may be too late for my family to get rich by making the world a better place, but I'm optimistic that others will have better luck. 100 years from now, some eVTOL entrepreneur's great-great-granddaughter could be telling a very different story, hopefully in a world that has built on today's innovations to solve the great existential challenge of our time. I want this technology to succeed in a way that benefits everyone. To that end, I hope that these lessons from the past can help. Alarm, thank you so much um, for that thoughtful presentation um, and, for, and for providing such a fascinating um, historical perspective. We're now going to move to the Q&A period. So um, I would appreciate it if people that had questions um, for our guest speaker would um, include them in the Q&A box and we'll get to a few of them um, before the end of the program at two. Um, I did notice, Alon, that there um, is interest across the board. Obviously, the timeless message that you were delivering about community um, acceptance, and I know that that's um, and community outreach, and I think that's something that the department's been um, working hard on. Um, I was wondering um, if you had any other um, perceptions um, that you'd like to share on on that on that topic. So I think it's a really interesting time in the industry and the fact that we're now talking and putting more focus on community acceptance uh, indicates that the technology is becoming more real. So we've been having these theoretical conversations about community acceptance for a long time. And now that the technology is far enough along that we can actually you know, see a line of sight to certification and operations, these are no longer theoretical questions. And you know, every single vertiport and route that uh, is implemented is, is going to face you know, real challenges, real questions, um, real concerns from the public. And so it's, I, I think, very much the time now that we should uh, be actively engaging with these communities, bringing their voices into the conversation, understanding what their concerns are, uh, rather than, you know, again, simply telling them the story about how great this technology will be for them. Thank you. Um, we have some compliments for you in the chat saying thank you for the fabulous story and your thought provoking okay. comparisons. Um, we also have um, an observation that, um, that one of our attendees feels that you are trying to cover sort of the risks posed by any new technology and 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 the need to potentially tread with caution um, and and be more pragmatic. Um, I also see a question about can some concerns be mitigated to an extent by highlighting other technologies under the AAM umbrella. Uh, and the wide ranging UAS applications. Um, yes, and I, uh, I'm uh, looking at the Q&A now and I see that that question's from Clint Harper, who's uh, I'm a big fan of. I think he's doing some fantastic work in the industry, you know, really raising a lot of awareness about these you know, community integration issues. And I think he um, raises an excellent point. So Another interesting thing about the stage of the industry where we are now is that a lot of the messaging of the industry today has really been targeted at investors because uh, building this stuff is very expensive. <laughs> and so there's been a, a huge need for investment in the industry. And um, now, again, that we're at the stage where this technology is, is becoming real and getting closer to certification, um, you know, we need to start adjusting that messaging uh, so that we're you know engaging more with communities and you know the the urban air mobility use case i think is something that captured a lot of attention and excitement from investors but there's lots of really interesting potential uses for this technology um, you know so the more we can find those alternate use cases and you know really expand the the pool of of people who can get excited about and behind advanced air mobility i think the better off the entire industry will be thank you so i am looking and um we also have a, a question that's um it, it says basically, this is Paul Cox, he says, I think that even if air ships had continued to be developed, they ultimately wouldn't have been used anyway. They suffer from some important 
uh, despite some of their operational advantages. Um, but he's curious how you think, Alon, um, like himself, that the single greatest difference in the market for the AAM EV tolls will be whether they can truly save a lot of time crossing busy urban areas. Well, I think there's a couple of interesting aspects to this question. And, um, you know, one of them, I, I, I think, is, is the fact that at this stage in time, um, other goals have also become a lot more important. Um, and namely, climate change has, has become a really big, all-encompassing goal. And so that's why you see you know, some companies trying to revive airships now, because it's not just a matter of saving time. If it was, you know, we'd all be sticking with airplanes, which can go very fast. Um, but now we're starting to like bring other objectives into the equation as well. And so with, um, with EV tolls, uh, I mean, we have helicopters today that can you know, shave time uh, crossing busy metro areas. Those haven't been especially successful at the urban air mobility role um, because they're noisy, they have you know, issues with safety uh, and they're not very climate friendly. So I think, you know, yes, uh, time is, is definitely going to be important, um, but I think we're at the stage where all of these other factors are gonna play roles in the success of this technology as well. I have um, another question that's a little bit more specific to um, community engagement. And I don't know if anyone um, from our department or any of our departmental leadership would like to, to take this, but they're asking um, if there's any working group developing or that might already exist that would help with best practices in community engagement um, and that their region would like to ensure that communities are, are well informed um, and that messaging supports both community needs and coming uh, AAM operations. Well, I, I'd love to hear from other folks, including uh, Elon, because uh, she's thought about this a lot more than, than many of us. But the, the, uh, the community engagement really is a through line for our working group. And there is uh, a lot of work, you know, in, across the country that's already underway. I want to thank uh, Cami uh, for raising its hand virtually in in the uh, Q and A section there uh, by talking about their work. We we got a wonderful briefing from from them, and through our working group, we we've also heard from states, from cities like L A. and and tribes that are already thinking through these issues. Uh, and uh, we we had one lunch and learn that was that was talking about the scoring criteria for potential sites uh, for vertiport sites that incorporate uh, environmental justice concerns. And focus on alleviating those burdens. You know, um, community engagement really is central. And and you're thinking about noise, about visual clutter. Uh, you listen to one of these uh, one of these aircraft. It's not much, but if you, I, I, but it could add up over time. And importantly, really importantly, is that multimodal traffic that happens around those vertiports. And these are all externalities that have to be considered. And and one of the comments in the Q and A was was that well, uh, which I would agree with well before those sort of ports of place. And uh, when you think about the auto revolution more than 100 years ago, you know, it's a wonder of the modern world. Uh, a, you know, the, our highway system is uh, is the envy of the, of the world, and it has it had tremendous benefits that we wouldn't want to take back, the efficiency, the economy, the freedom uh, for individual people to, to travel across the country. But there have been a lot of real important externalities, including traffic deaths and air pollution and, and physical separation that these facilities have. And, uh, you know, these burdens really have been concentrated in underserved communities. And uh, I know uh, we have a lot of work to do. I think uh, Dr. Hampshire said that that, uh, that we aren't going to usher in this future on its own. It, it, um, policymakers, industry have to ask these questions now. And I think the good news is that we are uh, and that there, there's a lot of work happening. And uh, and uh, it's going to be a, a, continuing, a continuing issue that, that we will uh, focus on. Thank you, Carlos. Um, Alon, we have another question for you. It says, uh, can you please comment on how you think the supply chain for certified advanced air mobility aircraft might work in relation to bringing EV tolls to scale in the US? As it seems there might be lots of customers across the world vying for the same aircraft coming off the production lines. Do you have a well, perspective on that? Sure. I think that's an interesting question and a big unknown. And I think every EV tall company is uh, trying to, to grapple with that. 
Um, you know, it's still unclear um, just how quickly this production will be able to scale up. Uh, also unclear, you know, what the, the demand for it is going to be and the pace at which, you know, we're able to like actually integrate this technology. So my short answer is that I, I don't have an answer, um, but, you know, I think that there's a lot of factors that are influencing it and everyone's pretty actively, you know, grappling with it. My hunch is that we're going to see, you know, kind of relatively gradual deployment that will, you know, scale up as the um, uh, manufacturing supply chain and communities allow. Great. And um, based on, on your knowledge um, of, of what you've seen in discussions around security, um, have you do you see a future um, for passengers that would look similar to um, current security practices? I think that's another question that the industry is very actively grappling with especially for some of these early use cases. Um, a lot of the initial routes for air taxis are from city centers to airports uh, for a number of reasons. That's a very attractive route and something that a lot of people are willing to pay time for to, to save time and make their flight. And so of course that obviously comes with the security question. I think ideally all these EVTEL companies would like to be able to have some type of TSA procedure on their end so that the passengers arriving at the destination airport can land behind security and save time. I think that's a big part of the time saving proposition. Um, but exactly what that will look like and how that will be guaranteed is something that still needs to be worked out. Thanks. Um, just another um, question that's more along uh, the line of land use planning um, and uh, an observation that, that you know the technology is cool, but beware of MIMBYs. Um, and I just wanted um, to share that. I think um, it was great uh, following up on Carlos's comment, Yolanka um, Wolof, who's uh, with CAMI is gonna be a speaker later in the series and, and we'll be expanding upon the community engagement discussion. And I was actually going to give a plug for Cami as well. Um, I think they do great work and really kudos to them for having the foresight to create that initiative, you know, back when a lot of these questions were still hypothetical because they recognize the importance of that community integration and engagement to making it work. Um, I think we have time for one more um, comment here. Um, it relates to noise uh, that, that Carlos had, had touched upon, which is uh, clearly going to be a major issue. Um, and the comment is that anyone who's been to a big city during the day can understand the noise made by helicopters uh, flying around. If these EV tolls become ubiquitous, um, it will make the cities noisier and wondering how this um, would be addressed or, or any thoughts that you might have, Alon, on that. So I will say I'm a helicopter pilot. I like helicopters. I love flying in helicopters. I think they're magical machines, but they are insanely noisy. <laughs> and, and, you know, they, they create a lot of, of, you know, unhappiness, deserved unhappiness, you know, just because they are, they are so noisy. Um, I do think that is one of the most promising aspects of eVTOL technology. It's important to note that simply, you know, making something electric doesn't guarantee that it's going to be quiet. But a lot of these companies have put a lot of work into designing their aircraft to be very quiet. And I have heard some of them fly now. I can say that they are, you know, meaningfully quieter than helicopters. And hopefully that's an opportunity to, even at larger scales of operations, make cities quieter and less obnoxious to the people who are underneath them. Thanks. So I'm just gonna wrap up by um, thanking you again, Alon, um, and for your time and for being with us today. Um, and thank you to the DOT leadership team that has also joined us today. The next two events in the series are gonna be held in December. And we hope that you will tune in for the second event in the series, which is gonna be held on Tuesday, December 7th at 1 p.m. The theme will be safety and advanced air mobility and will feature three speakers from the private sector, Cindy Kona, Director of Certification at WISC, Blaine Newton, the COO at Beta, and Eric Allison, Head of Product at Joby Aviation. 
and Derek Morgan, Chief Operations Manager for Aircraft Certification Engagement with the FAA's Aviation Safety Organization, will also be providing some opening remarks and an FAA perspective. So we hope that you can join us. Thanks to everyone for linking in and have a great afternoon.